Thank you for joining us for our Wednesday night web series as we explore a genre of music that has endured in various forms for over 2,000 years. This ancient body of repertoire continues to inspire modern choral composition today, be it heroes from the turn of the 20th century, such as French composer Maurice de Raffles' haunting setting of the chant, Louis Caritas, to the monks of Thézé creating a chant for all tongues during World War II, to the thrilling modern popularity of Hildegard von Bingen's entire body of work from the 12th century as a new millennium dawn. Chant has emerged as a serious body of work to be studied and understood by academia and remains a body of art which feeds the church and concert hall alike. But what is chant? And why does it matter? And why do we still sing it? Tonight, I will be joined by two multi-talented musicians whose expertise selecting, preparing, and performing chant, as well as commissioning new music, might help us answer those questions. But before I share our fascinating conversation about chant and its legacy in modern choral music, it might behoove us to have some communal understanding of exactly what chant is, historical roots of chant, one quickly discovers they reach much further back than the legendary effort begun in the 9th century by Pope Gregory to codify Christian worship across the Holy Roman Empire. While music historians continue to scour the scarce primary, primary chant resources that has survived for fuller views of early Greco-Roman Christian life, current scholarship agrees that our earliest chants can be traced directly from the rich cantillation tradition found in the synagogues of the time of Jesus. As Jewish and Gentile communities began to worship together and forge an early Christian identity, they would gather in small groups, perhaps in each other's homes, most often in the evening, to reenact the meal Jesus shared with his disciples before his crucifixion, commonly known as the Last Supper. These small communities celebrated together, perhaps by listening to a meditation on an Old Testament theme, hearing news from neighboring Christian communities, and to sing antiphonal psalms, songs as old as time that everyone would have known by heart. In the beginning, the vast majority of the middle, medieval world was illiterate. Mel melodies were simple, often step eyes with modest skips and jumps that were often formulaic in nature, easy to remember and designed to accommodate the different amount of syllables and chanted texts. All melodic rhythm of chant was generated by the natural stress of the language employed, be it Latin, Hebrew, or Greek. Opening and closing musical formulas helped orally denote where the beginning and ending of a musical phrase was, an essential feature of antiphonal singing. Chant's musical, textual, and ritualistic beginning was a mixture of Hebrew psalmody being translated into Latin, Old Testament readings with some elements of Greek blended in, centering around the development of how to tell the life story of Jesus from birth to death, all while surviving as a countercultural movement within the larger context of Greco-Roman political empire building. For centuries, chant repertoire was transmitted anonymously by the clergy and monastic communities of the Catholic Church by rote. As with the Jewish tradition, individual and regional cantorial styles were as varied and rich as the cantors themselves. Pre-notation, if the tradition was not passed on, the tunes and style would pass away with the singer. As bookmaking and musical notation continued to develop, the importance of an ability to capture all the details of chant increased. And so too, the complexity of improvisation and polyphonic expansion kept pace. While never specifically indicated in chant notation, Instruments of some form inevitably make their way into the musical life of early Christians. The amount of distraction instruments could cause from the word of God, or rather the original chanting of the text, was and remains a constant source of concern. Anything that draws the ear or mind or body away from focusing on the word of God is a gateway to sin and temptation, and it is everywhere. New compositions based on old chant melodies would continue to become more elaborate and that these elaborated sections of chant would eventually break off and become standalone uh, pieces, giving rise to the highly complex polyphonic choral music of the 13th and 14th centuries. 
Dear friends, try to imagine your local churches and synagogues without an organ or instruments, and it is easy to see that the early Christians had every right to be concerned. Chant has endured schism, repeated reform, and has helped support a near constant evolution of vocal and instrumental music since we as a species decided to try to write it down. Chant can be readily identified by the casual listener in its original form. But the flexibility that is naturally built into chant to allow, allows it to easily coexist side by side and often nestled within new composition while still invoking its original form. Martin Luther, when working on vernacular translations of the Latin Bible into the newly forming German language, he toiled over the old Roman chants of the Psalms, music he had sung his whole life. Ultimately, he would abandon the original chant melodies, finding them too constricting in an effort to maintain the clarity of the inherent rhythm of the new German translations. While forging a new way of ritual singing, his devotion to maintain the clarity of the word of God was a tenant taught to him by chant. The schism the Reformation caused across Europe would directly to con contribute to a new understanding of what chanting could or should be. Clarity of the words was paramount. Chanting notes are now embedded in a glorious four-part harmony driven by the natural rhythm of the language of the people. 1960 choral masterpiece, Ubi Caritas, does exactly that. Durfley takes the trouble to have the original chant quotation at the top of the score, and it is often chanted by a soloist or a small group in performance before present. Durfley affords modern ears the opportunity to hold the old and the new together sonically in the same moment. His early education in a French Latin school where he learned Gregorian chant as part of his faith tradition would influence his compositional style for the rest of his life. His work, now considered part of the modern classical choral canon, continues to help modern singers, be it in the concert hall or the choir stall, in church, to find their way back to the original chant melodies and forward again. Interest and scholarship into medieval music has increased greatly over the past century interest in preserving and recreating medieval music. During this time in modern music history, a phoenix arose from the ashes, Hildegard von Bingen. Thanks to Barbara Newman's groundbreaking book, Sister of Wisdom, in 1981, coupled with the formation of medieval groups like Sequentia, founded by Barbara Thornton and Benjamin Backby in the late 70s, Hildegard's large body of writing on natural history, her resplendent illuminations depicting holy visions, and her musical masterpiece, Ordo Virtutum, found new life. This was not the chant Maurice Durfley knew growing up in the Catholic Church. This was something different. It blew apart the notion that the sacred music we had known for generations was designed by and for men to sing. It was a clarion call for music historians. Surely there must be more women in the annals of history we just have to find them. Since then, Hildegard's music has been recorded and arranged across a spectrum of popular styles, and her work remains wildly popular today. Hildegard von Bingen remains a vibrant, modern gateway to enter medieval culture and music. 21st century composers such as Lauritsen, Yeyelo, and Pert all continue to use and be inspired by chant in new and exciting ways. These popular choral composers elevate chant to modern audiences, and chant continues to form the firm foundation from which the boundaries of the choral arts and instrumental music notation will continue to explore and expand, all while preserving interest in the past. This then is some of the true magic of chant for modern choral singers and composers alike. For in a moment, the performer and listener can become one with human history, when we chant, we invoke 2,000 years of singing into our shared present moment. And as the notes fade from the performance, it stays alive in our collective imagination to inspire the music of tomorrow. And that never gets old.
Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's presentation of the modern legacy of chant in choral music. Tonight, I am joined by two incredible practitioners of chant, uh, Walden Moore and Joanna Rose. Um, but first, I just wanna take a moment again to thank our sponsor for this event, which is the Rhode Island Council on the Arts. They have been an absolutely fantastic partner in keeping us going in these very, very trying times. And their support uh, makes programming like this possible and we are and eternally grateful. So thank you, thank you again to the Rhode Island Council on the Arts. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a brief bio of, of each of our, our, our guests tonight. Um, of course, uh, it doesn't really encapsulate all the things that, that they do and all of the lives that they affect with their work, um, but this will give you just a little taste of, of how incredible they are. Um, our, one of our guests tonight is Walden Moore, who I've had the, the privilege of working with for the, for the past uh, decade, really. Uh, he has been the director of the music of Trinity Church in New Haven since 1984. There he works with the renowned choir of men and boys, the choir of men and girls, and the parish choir, uh, mixed adult voices, in a regular schedule of parish services and appearances, uh, both inside and outside of the parish. He serves as a clinician, guest conductor and organist for choir festivals and church choir clinics throughout the year. Having previously served as organist and choir master of St. James Church in West Hartford, Connecticut, he holds degrees in organ from the University of Kentucky, Lexington, from the Yale, and from the Yale Institute of Sacred Music uh, and the School of Music, where he studied with Robert Baker and Jerry Hancock. He is the past chair of the Music Commission of the Episcopal Diocese of Connecticut and has served as a consultant in organ design for several churches in Connecticut, as well as being on the executive board of the Connecticut, cha Connecticut chapter of the American Choral Directors Association. In January of 2007, he was appointed adjunct lecturer in organ at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music and the School of Music where each fall semester, he co-teaches a course in liturgical keyboard skills with colleague Mark Miller. My second guest is uh, Johanna Rose, who I've also had the pleasure of working with for a number of years. She is a founding member of the acclaimed vocal ensemble Anonymous Four. She's appeared in major venues and festivals worldwide and made 20 over 20 award-winning recordings of medieval chant and polyphony and up to uh, as well as modern works uh, for Harmoni Harmonia Mundi USA. Anonymous Forest concert programs combined musical, literary, and historical scholarship, often interweaving music with poetry and narrative. Her contributions to the ensemble have included translating medieval texts, researching pronunciation of early languages, and writing musical arrangements. I know I've been the personal beneficiary of these absolutely incredible talents of hers. The voice of Joan of Arc was written for Anonymous Four in the oratorio Voices of Light by Richard Einhorn, composed to accompany a 1928 silent film. The ensemble recorded the work for Sony and performed it at Avery Fisher Hall, the Kennedy Center, and at Wolf Trap. Also in Hong Kong, Singapore, Vienna, um, under the uh, baton of Marin Alsop. As a member of Anonymous Four, Joanna has coached master classes and ensembles at NYU, UCLA, the Yale School of, uh, of Music at the Institute of Sacred Music, Cornell University, the University of Texas at Austin, the University of Kansas, Kansas at Lawrence, and many others. She was also a course instructor and guest artist for two semesters with Toni Morrison's Atelier at Princeton University. She has appeared with ensembles such as Pomerium, the Folger Consort, Early Music New York, and Tenant. She also co-directed Kleia Music, a project combi combining the vocal music of Heinrich Schutz and contemporary composer Ivan Moody. For many years, she was a soloist and choir member at St. Michael's Episcopal Church in New York City, where she formed uh, she performed such works as Box Magnificat and Monteverdi's Christmas Vesper Vespers. She is currently a member of the professional quartet at the Cathedral of St. Augustine in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Please join me in welcoming Joanna Rose and Walden Moore. Thank you, Catherine. Pleasure to be here with you. Oh, I am so excited that the Chorus of Westerly uh, 
first of all, gets to know about your biographies and also is going to learn about all the work that you have done with chant over the years. Each of you in your own ways have, have brought this art form into the, the 21st century in really meaningful and tangible ways. Um, so let's, let's dig into it. Um, Walden, I want to start with you. When, when did you first encounter chant? It was when I was uh, in high school at the local Episcopal Church. I was not a member of the church, but was substituting for the organist there. And I had never actually run across what we call Anglican chant, the chant that we do in the Episcopal and the Anglican Church, uh, which is a form that has, over the course of the years, evolved from plain chant, but in by sort of a circuitous way, uh, has come into a four-part harmonized form of chant. And I had no idea exactly what it meant. And I wish that at that point, someone would have just said to me, it's it's just natural speech rhythm. Let go of all the, the bells and whistles and all the squiggles and all the lines. And if you know how to say the line, you're going to know how to sing it. And it took me a long time to get past all the bells and whistles and the squiggles, mm -hmm. but I finally did. Yes, I, I can completely relate to that, that the horror of seeing the, the squiggles <laughs> and the, the panic that everybody feels. Oh my goodness. Um, and I'm gonna shoot that question right over to you, Jana. I mean, obviously you, you, you took it a, a step further, but I mean, you're, how, what, how did you encounter chant? for the first time? Well, oddly enough, uh, the first place that I heard chant was, you're not going to believe this, the New York Pro Musica many years ago. I went to see their uh, church drama, liturgical drama, the play of Daniel at the Cloisters. Oh. And that was my introduction to medieval music and chant. Um, as far as singing it myself, I actually, my first experience with singing chant was Anglican chant. My first church job as a church musician was at St. Mary the Virgin in New York City, and I was just thrown right into Anglican chant. I was like, what is this? How do you do this? <laughs> and so when we're saying Anglican chant, just for our audience, we're talking about four-part choral settings. I think, I think we're all under the same impression of what Anglican chant is, right? Is that what you're you're speaking yes, to? That's what I'm speaking to. And and the chant that I heard at the cloisters was not that. It was monophonic one line chant. Basically the entire liturgical music drama is monophonic music. There's no polyphony or or music with more than one line. Did so. they did, can you recall did they use instruments? They did. They did use instruments. Wow. Wow. They did interpolate little bits of polyphony, but mostly it was it was just solid chant. It's amazing. So then how did you take that and translate it? How did you take take this finding? Because uh, I think a lot of people um, in, in choral music find this gateway through the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that we, we, we find Anglican chant um, and then we experience plain song and it's remarkably different. So how did you take that and go, okay, I'm gonna make an all girl group and and chant in, in, in the concert hall? Um, well, it was kind of a circuitous route, but um, it ended up, I, I went to graduate school in a very tiny graduate program that focused on performance practice of medieval and Renaissance music. So of course I studied chant there. With and where was that? that? When was that? Where where was that? Where at Sarah Lawrence College. At Sarah Lawrence. Yeah, it was a tiny program and um, with very few students. <laughs> so we got to know each other really well, and we made a lot of music together, which was great. And uh, so we had a chant class with John Blackley, who is a proponent of proportional chant, as opposed oh, yes. to equalist chant, where every note gets the same value. Um, so the way, the idea for Anonymous 4 basically came from, uh, an experience that I had, uh, as a musician for a, a medieval culture week at Holy Cross Monastery in upstate New York. And we, we had eight 
uh, musicians for men and for women. Uh, and we did all the music. We did lots of different kinds of music, but one thing we did was we, uh, was the chapel services. And we decided at one point to do a, uh, a little Marian devotional service of about 15 minutes worth of music after the Vesper service, which is when it would have happened. And we decided we would just use the four women. So we put together a tiny service and we sang the service. And after it, I don't know, it, there was this hush. It was like something, I can't even describe it. It was like something magical happened and, and nobody moved for minutes. And then, you know, finally, you know, and it was like, wow, what just happened? And <laughs> that was the, the seed of, of, of the idea to use high voices. So none of the other w women in that little group were, did not end up being an anonymous four, but it gave me the seed of the idea to experiment. Wow, that, that, is, that is so moving to, to just have that, um, that experience in the yeah. moment and realizing, ooh, this is something different. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's, that's really, really cool. So, you know, this, this, this question goes out to both of you, of you because you, you come at it from different approaches uh, in the sense that um, eventually you were planning, Joanna, for the, the concert hall and um, Walden, you're looking at it from a liturgical and so, so you're looking at it from an ecumenical and, and from a teaching standpoint at a divinity school, you know, how, how to incorporate chant effectively. Um, Walden, I, I'm just wondering if you have have noticed an evolution in the past 30 years um, from the students that you've encountered with um, either through the church or through the school, people's level of comfort with chant, their willingness to engage with it. And uh, what are some of your impressions about that? A lot has been done through recordings being made available. For example, um, just not just with the advent, uh, you know, recently the inventor of the cassette tape just passed away this past week. And with the advent of cassette tapes, with the advent, of course, there were there were many, many methods of recording before that. But recording and, of course, now Internet access has made things much more mm -hmm. Uh, easily accessible, I guess you would say, for people. I've noticed that many, many more people on their Spotify accounts will have uh, chant, yes. and they'll come to me and they'll say, oh, I discovered this wonderful recording. I'd like to please listen to this, or I want to, you know, be sure to down upload it to your computer sometime because you need to hear this. Uh, I think that people have really come more into it through as much recording and also performances such as the ones that, that Anonymous 4 has done. Uh, they're just, I think up until at least when I was experiencing things in the first really in the 70s when I was in high school and in college, I was a, I was a student all through the 70s. And I, you know, things were, I, to me, just really beginning to wake up and be heard more often through these uh, media. Uh, back in the 1950s and 60s, Sir David Wilcox had done the famous recordings of Anglican chant from King's College, after which there have been many since St. John's College, Cambridge, St. Paul's Cathedral, London with John Scott, different, and of course, many, many have done it. So there's many examples of Anglican chant. You could do perhaps the entire Psalter practically, you can find in recordings. And um, in church, it's always been in places where they usually have a choir that will help lead it, that you'll find Anglican chant most common. Not that it isn't heard. There are many, many forms of chant. There, the uh, After the practice of the 1979 prayer book in the Episcopal Church, we came up with what was called simplified chant. And uh, we actually have a quick example of that if you ever want to use that. The Song of Wisdom uh, file has a little bit of that, uh, a simplified chant. One of the early ones that I was uh, uh, exposed to, and it's been set, and can, you can set any text in the world to it. Uh, it's a, a very short formula uh, based upon, uh, you know, early plain chant originally, but, but much transformed. 
and perhaps for congregations that might not want to tackle Anglican chant in its full four part. You know, it could Anglican chant can also be sung in unison. There's no reason it can't. You don't have to sing all four parts, but it it helps obviously, and perhaps more in the spirit of of what was done. Oh, that's a fantastic answer. Yeah, well, we're we're going to cue that up that um, that clip of Carolyn doing the Song of Wisdom. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, so. Another example of why Walden has the magic bench. It's just, oh, oh, our organ scholars are just incredible. My gosh. So now that we have, we've, we've kind of um, turned our, our stereo system on, Joanna, I want to turn it back over to you and, and see if we can get the, the, the chant sound back in our ears. I, I'd like you to take us away a little bit. Um, <laughs> So we, we we just saw this beautiful Anglican version of of you know a, an accompanied plain song. It's so beautiful, um, but for, I don't want to step on your toes here. I, I'd like you to to drive the 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 car a little bit. Um, can can you talk a little bit about repertoire choices and your your treatment of chant and and. Um, you ornament when you sing chant as well, and I, I just you know, let's let's talk and listen to some of what you do here. Okay, well, I really love what Walden said about the following the uh, the words because the, the, you know chant is really nothing but heightened speech. That's what it is. It's it, it's for a couple of different purposes, and w one of them is to magnify the, uh, the experience of worship. And the other, oddly enough, interesting uh, reason for chant, at least in the Middle Ages when they didn't have microphones, was that sung speech carries better than spoken, right? So if you were, you know, a, I don't know, a, a peon in some big public cathedral, you couldn't hear what they were saying way up at the altar. But once they started to sing, it was like, oh, that's special. Let me listen. You know, I can hear it. So that's actually a function of chant, which is really, you know, interesting. And, you know, chant really is the basis of Western music. It's the basis of Western polyphony. It's where polyphony was born. 
So with all that in mind, um, you know, our approach to chant is very much text-based. And um, in order to come to, you know, we took a long time figuring out our approach to chant. Because when you listen to chant, a lot of the time it's equalist, which is just like one uh, note value continually. And there's really no, not a lot of um, care with the, the, the text. So we said to ourselves, okay, we don't want to do that. We want to treat chant as equally as important as polyphony. Uh, it's not just a filler between polyphonic sections. Uh, so we spent a long time, you know, working with musical phrasing and textual phrasing to come up with our particular approach, um, which, you know, maybe is not, someone else might have come up with a different approach. This is what we did. So um, I think maybe the first thing to turn to is, is Hildegard. What do you think? <laughs> I think that's a fantastic idea. You'll okay. like get no complaints from me. <laughs> well, funny thing, just a funny little uh, uh, aside about Hildegard is that you know when we started this group, everyone said, "Oh, you're four women. You're you're going to sing Hildegard, right?" And we said, "Nope, we are not a women's music group. We are women who sing music." <laughs> and we knew that Hildegard is extremely challenging to sing, so we gave ourselves. I think it was about five years before we even tackled any Hildegard at all, because we really wanted to know what we were doing. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, so I've chosen a, a, a small antiphon, because uh, many of her works are huge. They're like eight, 10, you know, 12 minutes long. They're massive. Um, yeah, they're massive. And they're very vocally, very challenging. But just, just to say, you know, her chant, has its own language. Uh, her chant really has a kind of a different uh, melodic language than a lot of other chants. So the example that we're gonna hear at least does show her kind of ecstatic. Uh, she uses a lot of, of uh, large interval leaps, which is not always true in most other chants. So just, just to be aware of that. So- Heartily um, agreed. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so the chant we're going to hear is uh, an antiphon called "O rubor sanguinis, O redness of blood." <laughs> She's Ooh. very intense. <laughs> Hildegard is intense, uh, and it's only a little over a minute long. So, it'd be nice to to hear a microcosm of Hildegard. <laughs> Indeed, Ben. Let's cue that up. It's hard not to just 
instantly sigh with relief. Your blood pressure goes down. I start breathing as I'm with you as I'm listening. It is just so magical. And it's it's so hard to articulate what that is, that je ne sais quoi. But clearly that very first audience where you got that nard, and I say audience, really it was a, congrega a congregational moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it was this, that everybody was so quiet. Yeah. You don't want to let go of that beautiful um, internal world of that sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that is the effect that chant has, um, you know, both hearing it and seeing it as well. Um, and I guess that's, you know, there's chant from many, many different traditions all over the world. And a lot of it is, is used as meditation. And you can really see why. Mm. So I just, I, I, I'm thinking about this. There's, Willie Appel has this very sort of dry definition of what chant is, that mm -hmm. it is religious music that is purely melodic and vocal with no accompaniment. That is mm -hmm. the barest definition of chant that he comes up with. And that, that pure definition, like a pure Italian vowel, I find very difficult to adhere to. Um, and Walden, you know, I think about our work together when we approached chant, and and it was the same when I was I was working with you down in Bridgeport, Joanna. Mm -hmm. That that the temptation um, to just uh, let chant be on its own is a bit. It's it's not necessarily our go to. And I, and I love, I love the organ improv that I often get under, mm -hmm. under um, often like when I'm chanting in English. But I, I bring up that quote, I'm gonna start with you Walden and I'm gonna let Joanna kind of stew on it for a second. <laughs> what do you think about that, that definition of chant, chant? Is there like this, there's, do, you, do you struggle with a purist ideal of what chant should be versus what we do, and Ben, I'm going to have you cue up um, uh, uh, the um, the. Oh, I'm trying to think of the title now. <laughs> I'm blanking. Um, the close of day chant. Um, so Walden, get, back to you. <laughs> well, is it we should we should warn our listeners? It's a a very sort of Victorian idea well, of what what sure. chant is because we were Catherine and I were preparing this file for for singing for a choir compline online. So to give context, of course, we prepared this for for a sung service and. Uh, to, uh, it's interesting. It rocketed right through my head. The question is, we need to be really well informed about what we feel, how it was done. It's like studying uh, the organs that Bach played mm -hmm. and studying Buxtehude on uh, instruments that, you know, to, to know. We can't fully understand what it might have sound like. But underlining the word might have, because there are no recordings of it, there's not a lot written down that we can take as an absolute. Uh, Joanna can be so much more, could speak to this better than I can. She's spent a lot of her life researching and doing all this. But all, all I know is that certainly what I do is from a practical standpoint, but it's not done from the stage that I, that I wave off uh, historical research because that diminishes me and it diminishes the place in which I work if I don't try to understand what this was and then how I can adapt it. And again, you, you, you'll hear the bells in the organ in this example. And, you know, uh, I doubt uh, Willie Apple, Apple would have, you know, seen that as appropriate to the particular thing. But uh, as long as I think we're, we respect not only the research, but the reasons that, that if we adapt it, we need to be able to defend those, those things that we do. I, I yeah. totally, totally agree. <laughs> yeah, it's, there, it's always finding that balance between being informed and then I think having to jump off the cliff and actually perform. Right. Uh, you know, we, I think as, as church musicians and as early musicians, we all carry the weight of scholarship with us, but then we, we do kind of have to just, as my, my old teacher used to say, shut up and sing. <laughs> I know that that's kind of an unkind of way 
of who yes, well, just 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 <laughs> this is why anonymous for rehearsals could take hours and hours because we would be fighting over exactly that. <laughs> How are we going to deal with the possibilities? What our choice is going to be, knowing that there's no way anybody could really know, right? So yes, at a certain point, you have to just make a choice and go with it. Absolutely. So in that vein, let's let's cue up that clip of of me singing with Walden and and hopefully we can contrast that with with some of the the um, really informed choices that anonymous four had to make um, when <laughs> um, approaching you know organum and and faux bourdon and all that that incredible stuff Oh, it's so hard to be apart from you both during this Lenten season. Oh my goodness, I'm just singing with you all in person. Oh, it's wonderful to hear you chanting. <laughs> and boy, do I miss singing with you. Oh, it's 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 going to it's going to happen soon. I know it. So maybe this is a good time to pivot toward um, looking looking back. So that's that's the modern interpretation, right? We we I think anybody who's watching this would say that's chant, that's acceptable. I don't find that offensive, right? I, at least I hope, I hope there aren't um, such um, chant, chant purists out there that can't enjoy that. But let's maybe look at some more traditional sounds that, that Joanna has to offer. So I, I was thinking about uh, chant and the ways that it was used in the Middle Ages, uh, which of course is a enormous span of time, hundreds of years. Um, and I wanted to just uh, show uh, a few of the different techniques that were used with chant. And uh, the first one is actually an improvisational technique. And that's what you were referring to when you said yes. we decorate chant. So um, <clears throat> this was something that was very commonly done in England. Um, and the, the chant we're going to listen to is, um, it's a tiny little sequence. A, a sequence is, is just a, a chant or a piece that has a form of A, A, B, B, C, C, and so on. This 
tiny chant just has A, A, and B, B. So it's really little. Um, what, the, what the folks in England tended to do was to do uh, an improvisational technique called Faberden, which is essentially uh, making a, a, a 6 3 chord uh, and then moving, the chant would move uh, parallel motion with, so it's like a parallel chord moving along. Uh, and it makes this beautiful, very uh, consonant, very, very mellifluous sound which became really identified with uh, English medieval music and beyond as well. Uh, so I wanted to show you, I, what I did was I, I gave you the two first lines of the chant in just plain chant, and then I wrote out the, uh, the harmonization or the improvisation, I should say, so that uh, you can look at it and hear it at the same time. So that is uh, the sequence Miserere Miseris, and this is from a, actually an Irish 14th century manuscript called the Dublin Troper. Fantastic. Ben, so. cue that up. <laughs> You always want more. You always want more. Oh, it's just so beautiful. I, I, I can't impart to our viewers enough how, how much um, encountering your music um, when I was forming as a musician in college transformed my life. Your, the sound that you made as a group, I could hear your individual voices, but blending together in this, this way that is so transfixing and i thought i can hear myself in that mm -hmm. and it it gave me something really special to strive for and i i know i'm not alone in that i know you've affected hundreds if not thousands of singers in this way and and it, it just it it changes people's lives it really does well it certainly changed our lives <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of, actually one of the interesting things about the group is that uh, the four of us actually have quite different uh, colors of our voices. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even set out to, to decide that those four voices were going to work together. We kind of, it was just like, you know, it, who was available and who knew about medieval music and who wanted to do it. and somehow it just kind of we worked very very hard to get that win that's i should say that it was not automatic at all that's i'm so glad you shared that that's really valuable to hear i i think people are often um enamored with the the ingenue that somehow it just happens no it um, it, it took a lot of work hours and hours and hours of singing together for sure and and actually that brings up another um Another issue, which is that one of one of the ways that we became that ensemble was to do the work of uh, analyzing, as I said before, musical and textual structure, so that we actually would have a common intent. So we all knew where we were going with every single phrase. We had made a group decision about every single phrase. And that way, 
uh, that was really the only way that we could be as tight as we ended up being. So. I think Walden would readily agree about the importance of a roadmap. Um, <laughs> and actually, uh, this is a this is a great segue to, to talk about Tese and your mm -hmm. Walden, your development of the Tese service at Trinity, um, because that is again, it's a form of chant that when you put it in front of working classical musicians, they clutch their pearls for a minute. <laughs> and they 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 get nervous. They they want to know how it goes. And I know that that's a congregational feeling too when you introduce new things. So I I'm wondering if you might be willing to to share with us the some of the process of developing the Teze worship at at Trinity. Well, we as you know at Trinity, being an Episcopal church, um, we already had services of even song, which of course, except for the pandemic, continue to this day. And there was no thought of changing that. However, the rector, the Reverend Luke DeVolder, felt that, that he said, I'd like to explore even another type of spirituality that an evening service would bring. Christ Church New Haven does a beautiful Compline. So we didn't want to do Compline because that's already there in the city for a church doing it. So we talked about it and Tese was, was the thing we came up with. And of course, Tese is not considered a choral service and we don't make it a choral service. But what we do is we have one of our choirs in the gallery out sort of as out of sight as you can be in Trinity Church. And we they lead from there with a cantor, such as Catherine or, or someone else, uh, cantering the verses of the music. And the congregation has all the music printed. The choir has a slightly more elaborate version, but the congregation can easily sing along. And it, that has definitely filled a need. Uh, again, nothing bad about Evensong, but this is a different type approach. It's it's a both and. The way we see it is it's a both and approach. Mm -hmm. We still do choral even song, but we also do Teze. And I suppose in a sense you could say choral Teze, except that it's not that the choir is singing on behalf of the congregation. The choir is singing to lead the congregation as we would in any hymn or any, any uh, congregational service music on a Sunday morning. Right, right. And it, it's it's been so moving to see the the people who come to that service faithfully um, because it's it doesn't follow really any regular format that they're familiar with. They get readings, um, they get the Lord's Prayer, but there's candle lighting and there's this 10 minutes of silence that where we, mm -hmm. we meditate. But really the, the bulk of that hour is is fully sung. Um, and it's sung congregationally, which is which is so exciting. Um, but Teze has this chant quality in that um, it's open to interpretation. Uh, we could go twenty rounds. We could go two rounds. It's whatever the the spirit moves you to. So it's it's a little of like it's it's printed. It's in a modern score but it's experimental. We don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and it, it, but theoretically, everyone can join in in some fashion. You know, you flip that on its head and you, you look at chanting in more of its, its older form. I, it's designed sort of for the solo singer and on, in some sense. Do you agree with that, Joanna? It's really designed for both. It's before, I mean, yeah. You know, um, the, the, the ordinaries of the mass are probably really designed for choral singing. But when you come to things like uh, uh, the more um, uh, virtuosic chants like the Alleluia and the gra gradual, those certainly the verses would have definitely been sung by a soloist. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends on the situation, I think. Right. Um, organum certainly could be sung by a soloist uh, because it is basically this incredible ecstatic decorative decoration of chant. Right. Yeah. Right. 
Am I correct to think we have an example of organum we, that we we have an example of organum? Would Would you mind setting that up for us? It would be great to listen to it, don't you think? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, this is actually a, a, a relatively small piece of organum from the Codex Calixtinus, which was a, or is I should say, a 12th century man manuscript that. Uh, lives in Spain, and uh, the the entire manuscript is in five books, I think, and, and uh, book wow. five is actually the music, the music manuscript. Uh, and although it lives in Spain, uh, there are scholars who believe that it probably is actually of French origin, which makes sense in the sense that there is organum in it, because organ is uh, kind of developed in Paris at the Cathedral of Notre Dame. So there's a connection there. So uh, what is organum? <laughs> organum is basically, you take a piece of chant and you stretch it out so that each note of the chant lasts a very long time. And over each note of the chant is this crazy ornamented, beautiful melody and that's what we're going to listen to. So the piece of organum that we have here is uh, Kyrie Puncti Potens Genitor. And this alternates between the, the organum, which is polyphony, and the monophonic chant. Uh, I should also say that this is a troped Kyrie, which means that you don't just hear the words Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, you hear a whole lot of other words. Uh, it's an entirely different uh, animal. Um, and um, let's see, I think we're going to hear part of it. We're going to hear some of the, uh, it starts out with the organum. So you're going to hear the slow chant below this ornamented uh, line. And then you'll hear a, a little bit of chant after that. Fantastic. Cue that up. listen to just a full hour of just that mm -hmm. just that oh wow and just to, so that everyone is clear the chant that is under that is the bottom voice of the organ is the same chant that you hear after the organ so it's that chant just um you know pulled apart and decorated and that was basically the beginning of of polyphonic music. And they, they did this in two voices, the way we just heard it, but they also did it 
with it yet another line on top and then even another line on top. So it became really uh, very, very uh, complex, amazing music. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. So actually, I, I think you've, you've got one more example that I would, mm -hmm. I would love to get to, which is um, a, a French motet mm -hmm. that's, that's based on this same idea of expansion, yes. um, which is, which is what is going to propel us through music history at this point. Like once, once this polyphonic ball is off and rolling, it mm -hmm. is unstoppable. Yeah. But I, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let you tee this one up because it, I'll, I'll just muck it up, so. Okay, so this is crazy. Um, <laughs> what I love about this, it's a, it's a 13th century motet. Um, and many of the, these motets, although they are secular, they're not sacred, they're secular, they have secular texts. Uh, many of them were actually based on a piece of chant, oddly enough. So this particular one takes one word, the word Johanne happens to be, it's from an Alleluia chant, Internatus Mulierum, which is, uh, uh, you can actually show that because I did provide that to Ben. Uh, and it's a very um, elaborate chant because it's an Alleluia. Um, and the word Johanne has a long melisma all on one syllable. So that melisma is used then as the basis of this motet, which is a French motet in French uh, the bottom line doesn't really have any words. Uh, it's it's not really known whether the, the the bottom line, which actually I should add, is called the tenor. In medieval music, the bottom line is is usually called the tenor, which is from the Latin tenere to hold. So that's actually the derivation of of tenor and the idea of a basus or a bass didn't actually come in until later. So in medieval music, the tenor is the bottom line. Um, so this is this tenor is held, uh, it's not really known whether these tenors were performed instrumentally or vocally. Uh, we do them vocally. Uh, the other interesting thing about this piece is that it has three French texts, but and two of them are courtly love texts. So they are all about the courtier longing for the lady, the unattainable, uh, and, uh, you know, going on about how she's not giving him what he wants and all that stuff. But then the third line is a similar text, but it's to the Virgin Mary. So how does that... <laughs> You know, so this, for me, this is like a perfect example of how the sacred and the secular in in European culture in the Middle Ages was, they were blended. They were not, you couldn't really separate them. They were so interconnected that they, you know, they just, uh, we here in the U.S., you know, we're sort of from a puritanical background that really yes, wants to yes. <laughs> And it's not I'm clutching my pearls already. <laughs> I know. And and the thing is that that is actually still true of European religiosity or European mm. Christianity in any case. They are much more relaxed about the, the connectedness of the sacred and the secular than we are here in puritanical America. <laughs> so... <laughs> So with that being said, uh, what you're going to see is first, uh, I hope that Ben can show the actual uh, uh, Alleluia in chant notation, what we call pneumatic notation. Uh, and I put a big blue line around the section of the chant that becomes the basis for the motet. And then after that, I have given you the actual uh, tenor in modern notation. And so if you listen carefully to the lowest voice of this motet, you can follow the chant line with all this French frou-frou going on above it. Okay. All right. Shall we say Ben, cue the track?
Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. adventuresome. Isn't it? And, <sighs> and the other thing that I didn't mention also is that the, the you can hear that the French composers were not afraid of dissonance as opposed to that very consonant English sound that we heard. Yeah. Which is, yeah. it's, a, it's a, a great moment to talk about um, the skill set where I can't believe we uh, an hour has just uh, flown by. Um, but you both are, are absolutely fearless about um, tackling new music. Uh, and in fact, you you demand that it be part of of your um, your repertoire and your overall planning for the the institutions that you work for. So I I'm just wondering if you could um, I, Walden. I want to start with you because um, you know you you work with uh, all these students at the Divinity School and you know people who are flowing through the School of Music as well as the the youngsters and the adults who are coming into the choirs um, the the skills that you need to tackle both successfully because I, I think they share a lot of traits but I, I'm happy to be re rebuffed on that if you disagree with that but I'd love to hear your thoughts about how chant can inform our approach to new music. Well, so much of what, one thing that has happened during the pandemic is we've had a chance to explore music in a way that we probably would not have if we'd been doing business as usual. And, and as, as much as we have so much missed so many things that it's been tragic you know how much we've missed in so many ways but we've tried to make the best of as we could and one thing we've done is we've explored underserved music we were trying to encourage composition by underserved composer groups whether they be by by gender by race by whatever we're trying to really support people that in the past have not had the chance uh, many of those forms that i've seen go by many of them are chant inspired. I mean, you just, at no period in composition is chant going to ever disappear, I'm convinced, from influencing, especially sacred music, but not entirely sacred. I mean, I, as uh, Joanna said, there's, there's a lot more crossover sometimes than we give it credit for. And I think that that as we look forward to the composition, and I know that I'm never going to be the same about looking at choosing music that I was before the pandemic, because mm -hmm. I've had time to really, you know, and I'm in probably, I'm in the last, I'm six, almost 65, so I'm probably in the last decade of my active work, and you know that, and one thing I'm going to dedicate myself to is, is looking forward, and trying mm -hmm. to be a part of that change, uh, you know, of uh, bringing in new things, and supporting, and, and, you know, and, and sharing, sharing the old as well because all of these composers are influenced, you know, starting with chant on forward by these forms mm -hmm. that we share. Mm -hmm. so, oh, that's, a, that's great, yeah. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. you no, were, no, no, I'm, I'm gonna hand over to Joanna. I wanted her to, <laughs> yeah, to let her get her perspective. Um, so, yeah, so I think that um, the composers who have been attracted to our sound and vice versa have really been composers who uh, who bring in a sort of similar aesthetic. You know, a lot a lot of times we we hear uh, that a lot of early music groups and early music singers in particular uh, are kind of there's a symbiosis between them and certain uh, contemporary composers. Um, you know, my thoughts about it are that there are certain certain aspects, certain skills that you have that you develop when you're doing early music, which is ensemble mastery, mm -hmm. as well as the ability to to uh, really bring out lines so that uh, you know you, you don't use a ton of vibrato. I mean, nobody sings with absolutely no vibrato, but you know you don't sing in a in a real bel canto. Uh, uh, way so that any any kind of intricate stuff is going to really be uh 
apparent, more apparent. And I think that some composers are really attracted by that, uh, that possibility in any case. Um, and then, you know, there are composers like Arvo Paert, who, you know, he discovered this tintinabulation that he uses, which is just harmonically so simple. Uh, and it does actually bear a lot of um, similarity to, to uh, early vocal music uh, in that it's, it's very structural. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a lot of, you know, I, I think about the, um, the, the analogy between medieval architecture of cathedrals and how the, you know, that is kind of similar to the structure of vocal music. Uh, and I think there are, as I said, some composers who are who kind of embody that in in their own contemporary way. Um, I absolutely agree with you. I and I I think one of the things that I notice when I I've sung with you, and it's it's sort of with both of you actually, and I, I find it when I'm working within these groups, it's the the listening that you speak mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Um, but it's it's sensing other people. It, it the, it's the concept of blending that mm -hmm. you you can feel the person next to you breathe. Yes, that you breathe together as opposed to staggered. Uh, and sometimes you do have to stagger. And and mm -hmm. it, but there there is this um, internal symbi symbiotic relationship within a group where you you feel yourself coming together. Yes. Yes. And you're still able to be an individual, but you've become part of something. That, I think that's the power of unison singing on, on many levels. Yeah, well, it is. Uh, so we, we always used to talk about it as being the four wheels of the car. If, if anyone isn't you know, in sync, then it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think my feeling about the single most important uh, ensemble technique that you can develop is the ability to sing and listen at the same time. It's it's a very difficult skill to really, really develop that ability because, you know, when we start out, we're so focused on our own sound. Mm -hmm. Are we getting the notes? What is that, you know, are we making the right uh, color, whatever. And, but until you can actually say, okay, drop all that and open your ears and hear what's going on around you, then you can fit yourself in somehow and then it suddenly you become part of this incredible animal this living breathing thing that is yes nice to you. yes i'm gonna have ben <laughs> cue up the nuke dimittis because uh that's something i did with carolyn and sarah comfort reed down in um walden's church um and it was the first day that i met carolyn but she listens so beautifully and she sings so beautifully as does Sarah, that we, we as three sopranos <laughs> could come together and do a cold reading and have it be recorded and have it be what it was. So it's kind of the, the synthesis of all these skills that we're talking about <laughs> in the actual sanctuary <laughs> where we would like these things to happen. Um, so I am going to have Ben Cue that up.
Walden, Joanna, thank you so much for joining us tonight to talk about the modern legacy of chant in choral music. Your perspectives have been absolutely invaluable. I know that I can speak on behalf of the Chorus of Westerly and just say that you have given us so much to think about um, and, and carry with us as we, we uh, continue to make music together uh, and think about um, how we're going to approach music making in the future, especially chant. Uh, it's, it's a part of our past, it's a part of our present, and it is definitely a part of our future. And, and thank you for being such a huge part of that. Uh, we, we hope we can get you back again soon to keep well, talking about this it's, time. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> well, it's it's been an honor to be with you. The chorus, I have admired the chorus for decades and it's wonderful work. And I'm so gratified to know that things are going well and, and to be here with uh, Joanna and, and Catherine to the ongoing work we do together. Uh, I look forward to it and I will look forward to hopefully we can visit again at some other point. Indeed. Indeed. A quick thank you to Ben Barber, our engineer. And again, a big thank you to the Rhode Island Council on the Arts. Thank you to Ryan uh, Sanders and Andrew Howell for your uh, allowing me to tackle this topic. And a, a big thank you to the Chorus of Westerly family for um, always being interested in the choral arts and promoting vocal music uh, to the community at large. Uh, I hope you can join us again. Uh, we're here most Wednesdays, um, uh, premiering um, either our community chorus show or our Wednesday night web series. Thank you so much.